Hello there. My name is Claire Jones. I'm the editor of the Financial Times' Trade Secrets newsletter, and it's my pleasure to be here today for this fireside chat with the chair and CEO of DP World, Sultan Ahmed bin Saim. Sultan, it's, it's an honor for you to be joining us here today. These are unprecedented times for global trade. We've seen demand for consumer durables rocket, and that's put an awful lot of pressure on supply chains. Unfortunately, it doesn't look as though the pandemic is going away anytime soon. So how can we build a world in which there's better collaboration between businesses, logistics companies, and governments to ease that pressure on supply chains? Thank you very much. It's my honor to join you here today. And uh, you're right when you said that uh, we're seeing really the inefficiency of the supply chain uh, at a play, especially after the pandemic. Uh, demand is increasing naturally because there is a lot of cargo that has not moved. And then taking into consideration also the uh, new demand for cargo coupled with no empty containers. So a lot of issues facing the supply chain, and that reflected in high cost of freight, uh, delays. Uh, it's no more people asking how much it's going to cost me to buy something. It is really whether I can get it or not. That's the issue. It needs a lot of collaboration between many entities uh, in the world. In DP World, actually, we had an initiative uh, a few years ago, which is called World Logistic Passport. And it's basically looking at the movement of cargo from the Far East and trying to find how it can go faster. Uh, that uh, World Logistic Passport relates a lot to air cargo. I can tell you today, because of the delays in, or, and non-availability of containers, it, now it makes more sense even to ship by air. It just doesn't make sense to wait and pay the huge uh, freight rate. So what this passport is, is important uh, and we're using it and it is really showing uh, great uh, efficiency in saving days uh, for people uh, instead of the old way of transporting cargo, where basically we have uh, gave incentives to the facility in Dubai, airport, uh, Addis Ababa, Ghana and Latin America. So far is cargo that used to go to Europe which already congested, now can go in a straight line. That's one thing. The other thing is also blockchain. Blockchain gives us two things, transparency and gives us also encryption. And uh, with the way the inefficiency of the supply chain, a lot of hidden costs that are not necessarily part of the supply chain end up as part of it. Blockchain gives you also the ability to trace and track, and uh, we're using the system. And of course, it's helping us. Uh, Again, we, we, we need to use a lot of uh, digital solutions and uh, every company in the world had a plan and have been using digital solutions. However, during the pandemic, we had a great opportunity actually to really launch and accelerate through launching many platforms that are today helping us uh, in, 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 in the ability basically to uh, move cargo faster and uh, ensure that it is happening. Thank you very much for those um, excellent insights there. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating that we're in an era now where, as you say, it can be cheaper to transport things by air than it can by, by ship occasionally. And as you say, that also saves a great deal of time. So, so thank you for those insights. Um, there are clearly a lot of new challenges on the horizon for people such as yourself working in the logistics and the mobility sector. How can businesses operationally and financially prepare? Uh, well, companies have to change the way they operate in the past. 
to become more efficient using digital solutions and really improving uh, the supply chain. So supply chain, unfortunately, it is the only one of the few industries that have not been disrupted. A reason behind is there are many stakeholders who are operating and using this. And so it's very difficult to all of them to agree or, or use a system. But now, because of the high cost and delays, it is time really people can collaborate and use digital uh, solutions uh, uh, to become more efficient uh, in delivery. Also, we need to see how we are going to supply uh, the traditional place where cargo is coming from is the Far East. And you can say that China is the manufacturer of the world or the factory of the world. But today we can see that the dependence on one place to manufacture has its risks. Uh, despite the Belt and Road, which fixes uh, the supply chain outside China, actually the uh, problem is not outside China, it's in China. With the pandemic, with the, with, with the uh, lockdown, uh, it added more and more uh, to the problem. And so nearshoring is going to be something that is, uh, it's about time to start. Uh, a few years ago, people were looking at the ability to uh, supply the cargo and manufacturing it uh, where the consumers are. It's more evident now that this is needed, and uh, not only uh, foreign manufacturers in China, but also uh, Chinese manufacturers. They realize the danger of being in one place where it could be locked down all the time. And so uh, there are many places today that, are, that can uh, receive these industries, especially that industries of today, when we talk about your smartphone, it's not, you know, people, when you think about smart devices, people think of the phone. Everything you use today is smart, from your air condition to your refrigerator, to your cooker, to everything you use every day. These smart devices have one thing in common. They are not made by humans. They're made by machines. A human designs a machine to do the precision and the ability to build the particles and assemble them, which are nano size. An nano size can't be seen by a human eye. And so it's easy to move these. And already the demand in the Far East is so big that the local manufacturers in the Far East will cater to the demand in the Far East and other locations have to demand for the world. Thank you very much for those insights. I mean, nearshoring is definitely something we're looking at a lot. Um, how is that affecting your business at DP World? I mean, are you, are you adapting with that in mind that you expect there to be a wave of nearshoring or are you going to wait and see a little bit to, um, to, to kind of gauge um, exactly how much of it is just talk and how much of it is action and firms actually shifting production? Uh, well, uh, we have a, an advantage, actually. We started one of the most successful uh, logistic and industrial parks in the world, which is Jabal Ali, which really worked and has uh, over 8,000 companies actually producing, uh, participating in the uh, GDP by at least 32% in Dubai. Uh, in addition to Dubai, based on the knowledge in Dubai, we have London Gateway, which is now going to be also a, a free port in UK uh, that will build on the strength of the education and the digital knowledge that is in the UK. Uh, we have uh, another place also in Senegal, a huge uh, industrial park that's under construction. We have one in Ecuador, uh, we have in Dominican Republic. And uh, basically we call this a, a port centric operation, a port and industrial logistic park around it. And this is the best way to operate. Seamless connection between the two. And of course, if we have uh, an airport, then it becomes a dream for logistics because you have a port for sea cargo. You have a logistic park that handles the cargo and takes it out. And then you have an airport that carry things by air. And you basically you have a multimodal operation. 
Fantastic. I, I noticed that you touched on um, London Gateway becoming a free port. Of course, you had the brilliant idea earlier on in your career to create a free port in Dubai that's been incredibly successful to Dubai. Um, what would your sense of, I mean, how successful is that going to be for the UK? Can you maybe compare and contrast the impact it's had on Dubai <clears throat> with what you'd expect to occur in Britain? Actually, we bring with us a wealth of experience in starting uh, this project in Dubai, where we learned a lot. And uh, learning gave us today the ability to do it right. Because when you make mistakes and you, you try and you do work, you try, finally you know what works and what doesn't. Uh, the advantage in the UK today is they have highly educated people. So they are very suitable for uh, high-tech industry and uh, uh, smart devices and so on. Uh, it's a country where there are many innovations. They have one of the best traditional universities in Cambridge and Oxford, and they breed knowledge. And now that knowledge could be converted to industry. And this is uh, going to be an amazing opportunity. And I really admire the far side of UK government to establish this. Uh, we are fortunate to be trusted with two one in London Gateway, one in Southampton, and others are also uh, going to develop others. Thanks very much for that. Um, so you, you've mentioned a few of the challenges and how you're dealing with them. Um, of course, a big challenge is climate change. How is, you know, DP World um, really future-proofing its business against this risk? And how do you think other businesses and indeed the kind of logistics industry in general should be doing that? Uh, true, you know, I attended uh, the COP26 in, in uh, Glasgow, and that was the theme. Uh, that was the main subject. Global warming is not just uh, something that the uh, scientists are telling us about, we are facing it now, and it is really an alarming thing. And so uh, many industries, including us, are using alternative technology today. The alternative energy, sustainability in using uh, in all our ports today. We don't use any more engines. We use uh, electrical uh, uh, handling equipment, uh, which is really saves a lot of energy and uh, helps. We use even technologies where when we lift a container, when the container comes in the free fall, it also generates power. Uh, I know one of the subjects we discussed also in, in Glasgow, which we heard about it, is the hydrogen and other clean energy. I am pleased to see that also one of our companies, Unifeeder, is also uh, maybe the first trial of synthetic natural gas using 100% renewable wind energy. Uh, people today, I can tell you from our experience, they're not using uh, alternative or sustainability just because they want to earn uh, a hydrocarbon credit or they earn uh, appreciation. It's a necessity. And frankly, it is much cheaper, much cheaper to use uh, the sustainable energy, much, use it, much cheaper to, to produce it, much cheaper to, uh, to operate with it. You have less maintenance, you know. Uh, we compare when we had engines in our gantries and, 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 and forklifts, and when we have electric, you only charge a battery and it works. Uh, and so uh, this is something that the whole is going to go through. Uh, and you will see uh, that even in our ports, we, will, we are thinking of where to handle hydrogen. You know, it's similar to oil, but, but what we need to do to handle it. Uh, we have even uh, manufacturers are producing us to take space in, in some of the locations around the world to produce uh, hydrogen. Uh, it's very interesting time that these uh, alternative energy will come to play at a crucial time, and they are much better and cheaper, actually. Thanks a lot for that. So there's some grounds for optimism there. Um, of course, a very you know, high profile example of supply chain fragility came when the Ever Given became stuck in the Suez Canal. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, what were your initial thoughts when you heard about that news story? 
And how did you know? How did you react as the the chair and CEO of DP World to that news? When we 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 heard about in the news, it was really uh, uh, one of the fears. Always is uh, if anybody ever gets stuck in the Suez Canal, and it happened. Uh, our first port uh, next to it was Sukhna in Egypt, of course, and then Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. But the what happened there, of course. Uh, regardless of why it happened, the effect of it and the ripple effect is really delayed the cargo so much because uh, many uh, shipping lines that are using this crucial route to link, uh, you know, uh, Red Sea to Mediterranean and it is uh, a lot of trade, vice versa, coming Europe to the Far East and Far East there. Uh, suddenly it got stuck. And the problem is not only uh, what doesn't go, what cannot reach, in other words, whatever leaves from anywhere in the world in the Far East has to take into consideration, I cannot cross the canal. So you can't imagine the fear uh, that created and the disruption it created. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, this, of course, uh, is something in the mind of many people. There's no reason why this couldn't happen. Now imagine if that uh, blockage it did this disruption. Can you imagine what happened uh, today with all the closure of ports in Far East, especially in China? I mean, today you can't find an empty container. Why? Because all the containers are already full, supposedly going to their final destination, but they haven't. Usually the container gets full, goes back to the destination, bring cargo uh, to a country and they become empty. Well, it doesn't. Uh, another important thing I would say is uh, we are also involved in the North Trans Route in Russia, which is an initiative by the Russian government to uh, utilize the unfortunate situation, of course, where the uh, global warming has melted the ice and suddenly that route, which used to be closed uh, all year round, now only three months, it is uh, need to be used uh, uh, ice breakers. And uh, this is a discussion we had with the Russian government for a few years. And one of the issues for the government of Russia is really making sure that if they use it, uh, it's not going to impact negatively the environment. And uh, I remember uh, during a meeting with the President Putin, he mentioned to a group of 50, I was one of them, that before we even uh, operate this, we need to make sure that nothing will affect the environment because a lot of people who live on the shore of the North Route their life is the sea, the sea life, the, uh, the basically the lobsters, the uh, crabs, the, all that is uh, alive for these people and there's no way they'll allow it. So the decision was if they use it, they're going to use natural gas and Russia has a lot of it and they will not allow any vessel with uh, uh, using hydrocarbon to cross. Now, the interesting thing also uh, is... If you take a ship from Japan to London uh, through the Red Sea, it will be 24,000 kilometers and close to 40 days. And if you take it through the Arctic route, it is 13,000 kilometers and 18 to 22 days. So already using a vessel sailing, 13,000 will definitely not pollute as much as somebody who's sailing for uh, 24,000. And, and so that's also, we believe, will, will, will be better the environment uh, when, if that, of course, will happen. And uh, the decision now in Russia is to manufacture vessels and that can operate on natural gas or convert uh, the one on diesel to operate on natural gas. And of course, having an icebreaker to, to allow that. So this will give an alternative that in case something happened in the Red Sea or Suez Canal, there's not an alternative to route cargo to Europe and, uh, and the West. It's absolutely fascinating to hear you talk about the, the Arctic route, which, of course, we've heard about for a while, but, um, you know, it, it, it's good to weigh up the pros and cons. They're really, really interesting remarks. Of course, some people have said post-Suez and even before Suez, organizations such as where we are today, the OECD here in Paris, has warned that ships are simply becoming 
too big. Um, would you share that sentiment that we need smaller ve vessels and what happened in the Suez Canal was just an accident waiting to happen? Uh, well, let me tell you, I mean, vessels, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of cargo need to be carried, you know, need to be uh, in a big vessel. And vessels today are 24,000 uh, containers and they will continue to grow. You, you can't stop that. I think uh, what happened in Suez Canal now, they are trying to widen the canal so that it can take an incident like that. Of course, you know, the canal, even if you don't uh, widen it, even if you make uh, the vessels uh, smaller, still the number will be too big. And at one point, there will not be even space uh, in that canal to, to deal with the world. So it's good to have other uh, uh, alternatives. Uh, also, uh, if you today, if you remember, vessels used to be 2,000 containers. And the feeder vessel was uh, 500. Today, the feeder vessel is 2,000 to 3,000 containers, and the main vessel is uh, 24,000. Can you imagine if you, uh, if you say, well, we're going to go to small? That means to carry a 24,000, if you go with 6,000, you need four vessels. And so that means four vessels polluting the air more than one which is more efficient. Uh, I think there are ways to deal with this uh, blockage, uh, you know, to, 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 to avoid it. Uh, and the, but the world is growing and the trade in the world is growing and it needs somebody to carry it. Sure. Thanks a lot for that. Um, yeah, as you say, it's not necessarily more efficient and it also has an environmental impact. If you have smaller vessels too, that's an excellent point. Um, we're almost out of time, so just one final question, if I may. Um, you told one of my colleagues earlier this year that you expect the snags that we've seen in supply chains um, to last for two years. Um, what's your what's your latest forecast? You know, given the new news we've had on the the new variant and so on and so forth. When when do you think we'll see a return to normalcy? To, to be honest with you, I mean, you said it all. Uh, the the uh, uh, a lot of people uh, trying to forecast. I don't see really the ability to forecast. I don't think it will it will uh, disappear next year. Uh, I think we talk about twenty three, uh, either first quarter or so on. Because there is the problem is the world is growing, and the the the, the amazing thing is that the growth this year without the pandemic is much more than nineteen before the pandemic. That by itself is growth. And then coupled with the backlog of cargo, which hasn't moved. And then when you add the variances and the closure, I mean, there are countries today where they close completely, completely, okay? How do you forecast? Cargo has to move, but how? Uh, if, the, if the factory today is closed, and when the factory is opened, the port is closed. And when the port is closed, suddenly the city is closed and these variances will continue. This is not an easy uh, disease. And I believe that uh, the precaution uh, of how to deal with it is something we have to change forever. In other words, I don't see us, you know, we're going to say, okay, there's no more this disease and I'm going to sanitize. Sanitizing is very important. Raising a mark is very important to protect our life because this is a deadly disease. It attacks and it can kill. And it doesn't matter uh, young or old. I, I know people who are old who died. I know young who also died. Uh, so it is very serious. The world is taking it serious. And China, as a country where they started, they're taking it very serious. They're not going to uh, take a chance uh, just because they want trade. Uh, they, they, real, they realize how, how effective it is. And I tell you, if you remember, all of us, when we traveled to the Far East in the 80s, we all will see Far East countries and people on the left or on the train. In the 80s, I've seen them wearing masks all the time. In the winter, they wear masks to avoid diseases. Okay. This is... Uh, Today, and I tell you one thing, I mean, since the pandemic happened, how many of us remember getting a cold? We don't get a cold anymore because we, we protect ourselves. So I think the precaution uh, about this pandemic and the measures, 
nobody's going to take a chance. Uh, I don't see it ending next year, I can tell you. I hope sometime next uh, 2023, we can see the end of it. But again, do we have enough containers? Do we have enough uh, movement of cargo? Uh, can people be supplied? I mean, these are all questions that everybody is working uh, together. I met many shipping lines. Don't, they don't see it ending soon. They are very stretched. Thank you very much for that fascinating conversation. It was it was great to, to catch up with you, Sultan. And um, you know, thanks a lot for all of you in the audience here and watching from wherever you are in the world. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you very much.